Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the surfboard room. Um, I just want to welcome you all to the surfboard room at Pepperdine and just thank Pepperdine Libraries for hosting this women's um, guest lecture series. And um, we're so grateful to Pepperdine Libraries for, for sponsoring these wonderful lectures and the full schedule of events of um, what they have to offer this spring can be found on the website. So you can go there for, for more lectures. So thank you to Dean Rusa, who's with us today and to the Pepperdine Library staff. I'm Stella Erbs. I'm the Divisional Dean of Humanities and Teacher Education here at Seaver College. What that means is I'm Dr. Lisa Smith's boss. Um, Dr. Lisa Smith has been at Pepperdine since 2005 and is currently an Assistant Professor of Teaching of English. She teaches courses in early American literature and writing. She's currently working on a book that makes the writings of the famous 18th century preacher and revivalist, George Whitesfield, accessible to a new generation of readers. Dr. Smith is a fixed term faculty member here at Seaver College, which means that there is no research or publication expectation in her work. And so today she'll be talking about her book, <laughs> Godly Characters. <laughs> Uh, even though she doesn't need to publish, she continues to develop as a scholar and contribute to our community in this way. As a divisional dean, I can tell you that having a faculty member like Dr. Smith is a dream. And if I could clone her, I certainly would. She makes all of those around her better, including me. Thank you. I can turn to her for prayer, for a laugh, for professional advice, or an encouraging word. And that voice, I mean, come on, I just wanna to talk to her all day long, right? Her students also echo my sentiment, sharing positive comments like, the best thing I like about Dr. Smith is her open-mindedness and willingness to explore different interpretations of faith and religion. She also is very understanding of the situations of her students and doesn't try at all to push her own religion onto others. She was made to be a teacher. I don't think I've ever had a teacher who genuinely cares about me as much as this teacher. She checks in when she knows I'm having a rough time. And when I tell her I'm struggling with something, she makes sure to check in with me about it on a later date. I love this teacher. She is super friendly and made me feel at home when I was new. She is the best one could ask for. She helps you in ways you can't even imagine. I love the spirit and attitude she brings to class. Never a dull moment. <laughs> so sit back today, everyone, and enjoy this time, for I am confident that will not be dull, and you will have a fabulous teacher whose side note, just shameless plug, tomorrow's the last day for the Howard A. White Teaching Award nomination and faculty and staff can nominate people. So if you want to nominate this amazing faculty member, please do and help me welcome Dr. Lisa Smith. Thank you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. I, I think that was a little more than the three sentences I sent you when you asked for introductory material. You know Stella, though, you give her a microphone and you don't, you don't quite know what's gonna happen. So thank you, Divisional Dean Herbs, for those very kind comments. And you all know we have very generous students here at Pepperdine, so it was kind of them to say those things. Um, Thank you all for coming. I also want to thank Dean Rusa and Pepperdine Libraries for this program and for inviting me to speak for Women's History Month. I wanna thank Jeffrey Bowen, who's in charge of events here and publicity. He helped organize all of this, got me set up in the green room. There wasn't a green room, but he organized it all uh, for us, which was really great. And I wanna thank you guys 
for coming out. I know there's not really like an extra hour in anyone's day <laughs> to do something like this. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you also to those of you who are on the live stream. Uh, I've been told that if you want to ask questions, you can um, put them in the chat, but after the presentation is over, I think is the best time to do that. But welcome to you guys also. And Dr. Erbs is right. This program will be so fascinating that you might burn the chicken you're making for dinner. So be careful if you're multitasking on the live stream. <laughs> also, I'm gonna end uh, my comments at 3.45. I guess we don't have a clock. Sorry, just gonna pull my watch off. I'm gonna end my comments at uh, 3.45 uh, because I know people have um, classes and things like that to get to. So I'll try to wrap up by then or maybe 10 of, and then um, if anyone who stays wants to ask questions or make comments, that's fine. Well, anyway, I'm really excited to be here for Women's History Month. I love uh, events and celebrations of either individuals or individual groups um, because I like to see their contributions, but I also really believe the commonality that we have as humans allows us to really connect with any group and celebrate things that they've done and learn from them. So I hope that's what this talk ends up being today. I really hope that it's a time that encourages you and inspires you. It's based on uh, my book called Godly Characters, Insights for Spiritual Passion from the Lives of Eight Women in the Bible. And I do actually look at eight women in the Bible and here they are. I look at a widow who recognizes and speaks a prophetic word about Jesus to her community. I look at a single mother who saves her sons from slavery. I look at a princess who falters and unfortunately loses her faith. I look at a prophetess who steps into her destiny as a leader. I look at an elderly woman who saves a city from destruction. I look at a community outsider who refuses to conform and is memorialized for that. I look at a mother of an ill child who breaks through ethnic barriers and prejudice for the healing of her child. And I look at a wealthy woman who really changes uh, the fate of her nation by using her resources to help. So they're really different. Um, I tried to find women that were not so well known. So Ruth doesn't appear here, Mary doesn't appear, Esther. I feel like we've spilled a lot of ink on those women and that's wonderful. So I tried to find ones that were a little less known and actually half of these women are not even given, we're not even know, given their name in scripture. So half of them, we don't even have that. I'm gonna admit from, from, from the get-go that I'm not a theologian, you may already know this, <laughs> and I'm not a Bible scholar, so I'm not really coming to these women from that vantage point. I'm more coming as a literary scholar. I want to hear their stories. I wanna see their experiences, the particular time and place that they're in, in their culture, how they dealt with their circumstances. I want to let their voice be heard. So I'm coming more as a literary scholar than as a Bible scholar. Also, this is not really going to be an academic talk. Uh, it's because it's not really an academic book per se. It's more designed, like I said, to just kind of encourage us and inspire us. So that's how I'm doing it today. Well, you might ask why these eight women? Obviously, there are a lot of people in the Bible. There are a lot of women in the Bible. Why did I select these eight women? And I would answer you that these women are connected by passion. And you can define that in many different ways. Uh, motivational speaker John Maxwell defines it as fuel for the will, but it's basically the thing that drives us, right? It makes us act, it makes us move forward. I have up here the suggestion it helps us overcome obstacles, it helps us persevere. It's that something inside of us that gets things done, that gets us moving. And all of these women displayed this in their particular circumstances. Specifically though, these women, I think, display spiritual passion. So there's some kind of a connection that they have with God that helps them to step out in a passionate and energetic way. It's expressed very differently depending on the woman. Some women in the, in the book uh, will express their passion, their spiritual passion as intense devotion to God. Some will fight for justice. Some will try to serve and bless others. Some will try to create passion in other people. But whatever it is, they're all connected with this idea that they are driven because of their relationship with God to do things, to act on things, to lean into causes that they have. 
And we want this in our lives, right? I mean, what is it like fourth or fifth grade? They start acting, asking kids, what's your passion? We understand that passion brings authenticity. Passion makes us effective. Passion is contagious, right? Nobody really has the time or energy to just go through the motions and things. So we want to lean into things that are real and we want to display and excitement for those things. So that was kind of what was in my mind as I was looking at these women and how I selected them. I had uh, two questions for, that I kind of took into the book. The first one is, what does spiritual passion look like in our daily lives? So if I meet a person who is passionate for anything, but particularly for spiritual things or because of their relationship with God, what should I expect to see? What should I expect to see in my own life if I'm living a life of passion? And these are some of the traits <clears throat> that I thought related to spiritual passion. The second question I asked was, what does spiritual passion help us overcome? These are obstacles to us moving forward often, right? So I wanted to look at how does passion or desire help us move beyond them? So each chapter looks at one trait related to spiritual passion. It looks at one obstacle that we can overcome through that trait. And it does all of this through the story of one woman. So that's kind of what I do in the book. Today, I'm going to cover all eight women. Not, I'm going to cover two women. <laughs> there was some terror. Yeah. <laughs> On the live stream, I lost half of them. <laughs> now, I'm going to just look at two women that I think are different, but also really interesting, just to kind of give you a flavor of some of the things that I look at in the book. I'm going to look at a single mom and a challenge that she's facing in her personal life, in her own circumstances, struggling with fear, struggling with powerlessness, with hopelessness. And then I'm gonna look at a wealthy woman who is in a very different situation, but has her own struggles and how she kind of leans into changing her life and changing the life of others. So we'll start with the single mother. Her story is told in 2 Kings 4, one through seven. She is living in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Elijah, the prophet who shared a lot of words from God with the people of Israel has been taken up to heaven. And his protege, Elisha, is now a prophet in the area. I'm gonna read from the uh, New Living Translation and I'm just gonna read the seven verses of this story because honestly, I couldn't put them any more succinctly. You may know the story. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. Obviously, this is a great success story. <laughs> we don't get a lot in these seven verses. We just get the basic actions of what happened. But I'd like to dig in them a little bit deeper, specifically looking at the trait that I think this single mother exemplifies for us, and that's the trait of courage. Courage is important for passion because you only need to be alive in this world about two minutes to know that it is scary. <laughs> I mean... I could ask it. We could go through this room and have every person share just one thing that they're right now worried about or fearful about. I mean, there are a lot of fearful things, terrorizing things, even in this world, and we know it. And they will stop us. Fear as an obstacle will stop us from moving forward passionately in our lives if we let it. That's why I think courage is so strongly connected with acting on things that we really believe in, because otherwise, we're never going to take that first step. We're just going to be trapped by fear. Now, this single mother has a lot of reason to fear 
She's female in a time where she doesn't have a lot of um, rights because of that. She's a widow, so she has no connection with a male who would have had more uh, economic and financial opportunities. She needs to support her two children. It's not just her she has to worry about, but she's concerned for them. And she's in debt. So she's not really in a power position in any way. So it's not surprising that she's going to be facing fear. I wanna look specifically at um, what she does and then the effects of what she does. First of all, what does she do? Well, the very first thing she does is she takes the first step, right? She asks for help. She goes to Elisha when he says, what do you have? She says, well, I've got a little bit of oil. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't think I would even mention that oil. <laughs> that oil's probably not going to solve the problem, right? I mean, can you imagine, Elijah, what, what, could, what do you have? What can we do? I've got a flask of oil. Okay, that's not even going to factor in to solving this problem. But she mentions it because it's what she has. And so that's why I know her is taking the first step. She understands before Jesus even appeared on the earth, she understands his parable of the talents, as it's sometimes called. It's a story Jesus tells in Matthew 25, where an employer is going away for a time and he asks three of his employees to take care of some matters for him. And he gives one employee five bags of talents or whatever, that is, silver, gives another employee two bags of silver and a third employee one bag of silver. And then he goes away and the two employees who had the five bags and the two bags work with their money and double it. But the third employee is nervous about losing it. So he just buries in one bag. When the employer comes back, he's happy with what the one who had five bags and the one who had two bags did. He's happy with both of them. And interestingly, they both get the same reward. Even though one had more, they both used it, right? And it was blessed. He's furious with the man who just buried his one bag. He said, you could have at least put it in the bank and I could have gotten interest, right? So in God's economy, when we use what we have, it matters. We don't have to have the resources to accomplish the entire vision we have <laughs> all at once, right? We just have to have, look at what we have and take that first step. And that's what she does. She's like, I've got some oil. So that, first of all, is pretty impressive to me. Secondly, she obeys what Elisha says, and she trusts him. She goes and she collects the jars of oil. Now, I'm gonna, this, this is going to be hot tip number one in this talk. Um, if you're ever in a situation where you feel like you want to step forward because you're passionate about something, but you're concerned that you don't have the faith to do it, obedience can bridge that gap. Obedience can move us, just doing what we know is the right thing. And you can use a different word than obedience. In this case, she was doing what she felt God wanted her to do. But just moving forward, even though you might not feel in your heart like everything's gonna work out, that can actually carry you through a time when you're struggling with faith. We don't know what she was thinking when she was collecting these jars. She might've been thinking, this is the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> well, she might have, this is never going to work out, right? She might really have been thinking that, but it doesn't matter. She did it. She moved forward and that bridged the gap, even if her faith was lacking. I'm also intrigued by what she was not able to do because she was collecting jars. We don't know how long she had. We don't know if the creditors were coming in two hours, six hours a day. I'm going to admit right now, if I was her BFF, I would be like, no, girl, we're not connecting jars. We are going across town and we're going to talk to your rich uncle. And we're going to get a loan, right? Or we're going to go to the company of profits your husband worked for for 30 years and we're going to do a pizza fundraiser. Like I would have had much better ideas. I, I just think, wow, she didn't do, she chose not to use her very precious time to do a lot of other things that probably made more sense. But because of her connection with God and because of her spiritual passion, she believed the word of Elisha and she stepped forward. I want to encourage you. It doesn't always have to be the practical safe thing. If you feel called to something, if you want to step forward in something, you can display courage just by taking that first step. And even if you don't feel it in your heart, just by moving forward. She also commits totally. She gets as many jars as she can. And guess what? God's oil doesn't run out when there's like a jar left. God's oil stops when the jars stop, right? God always has enough resources for us. We can be courageous because we're not just relying on ourselves. 
We're also relying on what God has for us. That leads me to uh, the last point for her is that she accepts interdependence. So she's in a community. People are relying on each other. Her sons are relying on her. She's going to Elisha for advice. Elisha is probably praying for her. She has to go to her neighbors to get jars from them. They have to be willing to give jars. So there's a lot of interdependence going on. And sometimes I think we think of courage as something we have to do ourselves, right? Even that phrase, screw up your courage, right? You got to, get, get, right? It's, it's not a lack of courage to ask for help. In fact, it's wise to look around for people in our lives who can bolster our courage when we want to act passionately. Every single person in here could also share a story of a time you wanted to do something, step forward into something that mattered to you, and you were hesitant, and then you just, that one friend just came along and was like, you totally can do this, right? Let, let's do, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you, or I'll, right? That one friend is just sometimes all we need. Sometimes it's a teacher. Sometimes it's a, a group leader of a small group we're in. Sometimes it's a parent, but somebody will come to us and just say, you can do this, let's go. She had her neighbors behind her. She had Elisha rooting for her. She was doing it with her sons. So she wasn't alone. And that's still courageous. It's still courageous to move forward, even if you know you need some people to help you out. So those are some of the things she does. Um, I'd like to just kind of wrap up her story by looking at the effects, what actually happens because of what she does. First of all, her hope is restored, right? We realize that. Um, she was in a situation where she was hopeless, very fearful, didn't know what was going to happen, but her hope is restored and now her future <coughs> looks really different. Her future looks really different. Secondly, she got to witness a miracle. I mean, that's, that's a big thing. She got to see God intervene in her life and in the life of her family. And actually, I think probably one of the most powerful effects for her is that she now has a testimony of God acting in her life. I am guessing that in that family, if their father was part of the prophets, the children and she probably heard the prophet dad talk a lot about God. God is like this. God is like that. You can trust God. God will help you, right? That's a lot of talk till you see it happen in your life. And now it's happened in their lives, right? The boys and the mom have a testimony that they can now take with them when they encounter other difficult times, when they have a friend who's struggling, they can say, hey, guess what happened to me, right? Because now it's not just words on a page and it's not just something their dad said or their husband said. Now it's something they have experienced. God saw them God intervened for them in a miraculous way. That's huge. And if we never step out courageously, we don't give God that opportunity, right? When we do step out in courage, we're putting ourselves in a place where we're open to receive and to see what God does. We're open to getting a testimony, to witnessing a miracle, to see something happen. So that's kind of, the, I think, one of the biggest benefits of what she experienced. So that's our story from courage to fear, looking at the single mom. I wanna move on to the second woman. Um, she's gonna be very different than the single mom that we just looked at. I'm gonna look at the last woman in the book, which is uh, the wealthy woman. Some of you may recognize her name, Abigail. Her story is in 1 Samuel 25. She's really different from our first woman. She's wealthy, she has resources, she has a husband, she has a whole household. So it's a very different situation than the other woman, but she still has circumstances that she's dealing with. Um, first of all, her household is about to be attacked. She has a small army bearing down on her and her household. Secondly, she has what I'd call a more chronic problem or chronic struggle in that her husband is a very difficult man. Her husband is Nabal, and if you know the story, some of you are shaking your heads, yes, you know what the Bible says about him and how the Bible describes these two people. About Abigail, it says she was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. His own, so thank goodness this didn't come up on a course eval, right? <laughs> you didn't read those, thank you. 
um, his servants <laughs> say about him, he's such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail herself calls him a fool. It's not an easy life with a person like that, right? That, that had to impact Abigail. That had to impact what she thought of her future, probably brought some fear <laughs> into her life. But this has been sort of her more chronic problem. And it's because of her husband that the small army is now bearing down on her household. But I'll go into that story. I don't want to read the whole story from the Bible, but I'll just sort of summarize it. The other key player in this story is David, who, if you know your Old Testament, he ends up being the king of Israel. At this time, though, in 1 Samuel 25, he's not the king yet. He has been anointed as king. God has given him certain promises but because he has become popular and because he's been anointed as king, the current king, King Saul, has driven him out of the capital city. And David is wandering around with about 600 men in the desert, trying to keep his posse together, <laughs> trying to keep spirits up, <laughs> trying to keep his own spirits up, trying not to be killed by Saul's much larger army. So he's in the story as well. At the time of this tale, when we meet Abigail, her husband Nabal's uh, shepherds have been out in the desert where David and his men are, and they've been letting their sheep graze until it's time to bring them in for the sheep shearing festival. So David and his men think, oh, well, we'll help them while they're out there. They're out here with us anyway. We'll protect them. We'll make sure none of their stuff is taken. And maybe during the sheep shearing festival, Nabal will, will give us something for helping them out. So the shepherds come back. There's a big festival. Nabal's in high spirits, and David sends some messengers to Nabal, says, hey, um, you know, we protected your shepherds, and this is sort of a time of goodwill and, and sharing and celebration anyway. Is there anything you can spare for us? You know, we got a group of people out here, and, and we really need something. Well, based on what I've already told you about Nabal, you can probably guess what his response will be. Here it is. Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young man. Who does the son of Jesse think he is? That was David's father. There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered from my shearers and give it to a band of outlaws who comes from who knows where? Okay, total slap in the face of David. Nabal probably knows who David is. David had already at this time military victories and he was a known person. <laughs> so Nabal is saying this specifically to him, right? He's trying to insult him. Well, David is like, okay, well, if you want war, we're getting war. So he takes 200 of his 600 men, says, you guys protect things here. He takes 400 and he's like, we're going to Nabal's. This is what he says. A lot of good it did to help this fellow. We protected his flocks in the wilderness and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he has repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is left alive tomorrow morning. So you can see the threat. Well, the story goes on to say that the servants, after they see this scene developing, Mabel's servants are run to Abigail and they're like, you got to do something because men are coming here and Mabel caused all of this. You know, you've got to help us out. The Bible says that Abigail acted quickly. That's the one phrasing in, I think, the NIV. Um, she acted quickly. She gathers a bunch of supplies. She sends them off to find to David in the wilderness. Then she herself goes out to David. She gets off her means of conveyance mule. I uh, wasn't a Bible scholar. I explained that. She gets off. She kneels before David. She says, look, I am sorry. Let the blame fall on me. I didn't see them. Please forgive us. Please forgive what Nabal said. I know that's not who you are. Please accept this gift and please don't slaughter my household. And David relents. He decides not to do it. When Abigail comes home, Nabal's in high spirits. So being a wise woman, she doesn't choose that moment to tell he's kind of drunk and celebrating. Uh, so the next morning she tells him what happened. And the Bible says that his heart, became, his heart failed him and became like a stone, which some people think might have been a stroke or paralysis. And then 10 days later, God struck him and he died. David, hearing what had happened, felt vindicated, and then went on to actually send messengers again to Abigail's household, and this time asked her to become his wife, and she accepts. So she becomes his third wife. 
Okay, another great uh, success story. This woman, Abigail, stops the destruction of her household. Um, she gets out of her very difficult situation and she now is aligned with David, who of course will be king of Israel. The trait I wanna look at for her is generosity. Again, this is a trait that we might not think. We think about acting passionately or about spiritual passion, but it is important because it's outward looking and it's also investing outwardly. So it's looking at people, events, causes, whatever move us in such a way that we want to pour ourselves into them and it's looking away from ourselves. That's why I've linked it with despair. Abigail certainly could have been despairing based on her marriage, based on the fact that this small army was coming uh, against her household. Despair is when we feel discouraged, we feel like we can't press on. Sometimes paradoxically, and many of you have discovered this, I know for yourselves, when we look outward and invest in others, it kind of releases us from our own despair, especially if we're reaching out to people who themselves are kind of trapped in discouragement. So that's what I wanna look at with this. How does Abigail's generous spirit actually help her and help David? Okay. We're gonna look at two, two things, what she does and what the effects are, same as with the other woman. First of all, what does she do? Well, I wanna look at what does she do in the immediate moment, right? Because the immediate moment is where her focus is initially. She has to deal with the people who are coming against her household. <clears throat> I'm calling this generosity in the present. Now she has two people who need her help. Nabal needs her help because he and his household are about to die. And David needs her help because he's about to commit a slaughter that he probably won't be happy that he committed later on. There was a preposition that should have been there. You got that. Um, so what she does first, I know this is basic, but she just flat out meets the needs of others. She just sees what's in front of her. The scripture says she acts quickly. I don't mean this in a, in a snide way or a disrespectful way, but you know, could Abigail maybe have prayed about what to do for a few hours till David maybe at least got close to Nabal's tent or you know, decided, well, I think I'll submit to my husband and let this just fall on his head. She could have just let things go. Right? I mean, she's, she's in a position where doing nothing might actually free her from a very difficult marriage. So what's interesting is she doesn't even think about any of that. She just acts quickly and she goes and tries to stop David from doing this. Also, interestingly, just a story or two before this, David has just spared Saul when he found him asleep. And he just cuts a piece off his robe. So in the same way, I think Abigail kind of spares Nabal in the sense that she jumps right to his defense and she wants to help him regardless of what she herself has suffered from him. She's willing to receive Dave, uh, Nabal's wrath. I mean, if he didn't want to send the supplies six hours ago, I don't think he wants to send them now. You know, so she probably knows being the kind of man that he is that she's going to get an earful for what she did, but she's willing to do that. And she's even willing to apologize when it wasn't her fault. She's willing to take on herself the blame. That's some hardcore generosity <laughs> for a need that a person has right in front of you. Was it Ronald Reagan who said, you, it's, it's amazing how much you can accomplish if you don't need to take the credit? Well, in this case, it's amazing what you can stop and in situations you can help if, if you're not worried about who's really to blame. So she acts quickly, she does that. She also personalizes her help. She knows that Nabal is too proud to apologize. And so she does it for him. She knows that he is too stingy <laughs> to give anything to David. And so she does it for him. She does the exact things that he can't do. In that way, she is generous toward him. And for David even, she knows he needs certain kinds of supplies that will travel, that will keep in the desert, that aren't that, e that difficult to pack. And, and to move with. So she also sends those kinds of things. For us, this, I like this aspect of Abigail because these are the people that are right in front of her. She doesn't have to travel across the country or across the world to help people. She's just looking at the people in her circle of influence and she's just meeting their needs and she's doing it quickly without a second thought. The number of good ideas I have to help people that get thrown out of my head because I give it a second thought. <laughs> 
the road to hell. Anyway, <clears throat> she also, <laughs> sorry, that went dark. She also uh, experienced or evidences generosity in the future in the sense that she invests in what can be, not just the immediate need, but she sees that she can meet a need that David may not even know he has. Specifically for David, he's in a tough situation. He has been anointed as the king of Israel, but at this point, Samuel, the prophet who anointed him, has died. So the only guy who really felt it from the Lord for him is gone. Michael, his first wife, has been given to someone else. He's been driven out of the city. He has 600 men versus several thousand men. He's hiding in the desert. He's probably starting to really lose faith in God and in God's promises. And so Abigail speaks to this. This is a long quote. I'm sorry, but I do want to read it because I think her words are really interesting. She says, please forgive me. She's speaking to David. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty for you are fighting the Lord's battles. And you have not done any, and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones from a sling. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me your servant. Super powerful words, right? What is she doing? She's first of all affirming his identity. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty for you are fighting the Lord's battles and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Lasting dynasty, fighting the Lord's battles, reward, you've not done wrong. She speaks to who he is as, as a man who has been called by God, anointed by God. And we know from elsewhere in the Bible, he's called a man after God's own heart. She speaks to and affirms this identity. How different is this from what he heard from Nabal? Right? Completely different. She also reminds David of God's promises. We all know <laughs> that when we're trying <clears throat> to act with passion on the things we care about, we will hit those moments when we're just not sure it's going to work out, right? And David is probably in one of these moments. He's, he, he's hurting, right? He's probably afraid. And she's like, you have to remember what God has promised you. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, I'll stop there. But that idea of affirming that this is going to happen. Remember, God is going to protect you. He's going to take care of your enemies. You can count on those things. By speaking to his identity and by reminding him of God's promises, she is really encouraging him. And that's a powerful package, right? And we can do the same thing for ourselves and for other people. Questions like, how do I see the people in my life? How do I see myself? What are God's promises for the people in my life? What are God's promises for me? If those are in the forefront of our mind, if we remember we're loved by God, we're called by God, we're precious in his sight, that's who we are. We're his children. Other people are his children as well. When we remember that, we can speak to that identity. Because not a lot of you know the verse from Jeremiah, right? Powerful verses like this in the Bible. When we spend some time getting God's mindset and God's view of who we are and who other people are, it can be powerful. And in this case, she takes those two things, the identity and God's promises, and she makes a third step, which is she encourages David to act according to his identity, when the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. David doesn't need to avenge himself. He's chosen by God. He's the anointed king. He's going to be the leader of Israel. He wants to be the spiritual leader of Israel as well. So he wants to keep a pure heart before God. She speaks to this. She's like, don't, don't do this thing that isn't in line with who you are. 
in the book, I, I share a story of, um, which is a known story of Stephen King, the famous novelist. Before he had published any novels, he was working as a teacher and he was writing like at night in his laundry room. <laughs> and the family was struggling. And he tells the story of how one day the school offered him a second, a second job, like a little part-time job to make some more money. And he said to his wife, well, I'm gonna take it because we can get more money. And she's like, no, you're not taking it. She's like, you won't have time to write. And he's like, well, I know, but she's like, no, you're a writer. You need time to write. Now calling your husband a writer when he's writing, scribbling away for several hours in the laundry room at night, I'm not sure about that, but that's what she saw in him, right? And so she's like, no, this is not consistent with your identity as a writer to take a second job that will take away all your writing time, right? And incredible, right? The impact of something like that. He acted according to his identity, obviously, really did become a writer. I guess he was. Lastly, she invests personally in David. She becomes his wife. I am not telling you to marry everyone who needs your help, okay? <laughs> but she adds actions to her words, right? And we can all do that as well. If we're going to encourage uh, our friend who wants to, I don't know, apply for some internships in a certain city, we can offer to help drive them. Or the friend who wants to pick up a minor, we can take a class with them, whatever it might be. We can come alongside people and add actions to our words. And that's what she does. Well, the effects are great. Of course, hope is uh, restored. David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. So the household is saved and David acts now according to his identity. Abigail also has a new life. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. So she has a whole new situation now. And I'll tell you this, takeaway number one, little things can have big impacts, right? She just helped the people in her sphere of influence. She didn't get a government position. She didn't start a foundation, she, right? She just leaned into the people who were there. She was generous. She got herself out of despair. She got David out of despair. So these women were both really different. Um, they both had very different circumstances. They had very different needs, but they acted according to traits that I'm kind of linking with passion or spiritual passion. It's that relationship with God that can move us forward courageously and that can help us to be generous. And I thought for Women's History Month, they were great ones to sort of highlight. I'll kind of end with this verse from 2 Timothy. These are the words of Paul to someone he's trying to encourage, Timothy, someone that he taught and trained. He says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And that's true for all of us, right? Whatever sphere we're in, whatever our circumstances are, hopefully you were inspired by just some of the things I shared about these two women, little snapshots of just two people. Only one of them is even named in the Bible, but we can see their impact. So thank you. If you have interest in looking at the other women, um, you can get my book. Available from the publisher and also from Amazon. So thank you very much. What are up? Um, I guess we can pause and see if there are any um, comments either from you guys here. I don't know if the live stream can do that. Jeff. Oh, you just, I thought you went to say something. It's just got a mic. So yeah, if you have any uh, comments you want to share or any questions, I'm happy to receive them. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm sorry I can be a little bit late, but I'm asking. My question is, what motivates you to write this book? I'm curious to know how it came about and what the circumstances are you thinking? Thank you. So the question was, um, what motivated me to write the book or what the circumstances were uh, surrounding the book? Thanks for that question, Mary. Um, interestingly, uh, I had been teaching some of this material in the church I was involved in. And after I taught it one time, I just thought, I don't know, I just felt sort of <laughs> prompted by God 
spiritual passion, to, to write it as a book, which I thought was a fabulous idea because I'm like, well, I'm an academic. I've published a book. I know how to do this, right? So I wrote the introduction and gave it to my friend who does a lot of writing more in kind of the lay Christian arena. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, this is the worst thing I've ever read. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, this is way too academic. If you want to write a book that's just more for a lay audience and you want to share about things you've learned and, and things that have touched you, she's like, you got to change a lot in here. So it was actually a really hard shift for me. And it gives me a lot of sympathy for my English 101 writing students and, and people who try to write in other genres, because it was really a genre shift for me and it, it took some time, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed um, some of the differences with a book like this, where you can put a little more of yourself into it. Academic writing, they really only care about the content and the style is very flat because it's really the, the material that's there that matters. So in this book, I had to you know, share personal stories and examples and try to connect with the reader in that way. So it was fun, but it, it, was, it was challenging. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you mentioned a little bit of the process of your 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 unearth this material for myself? What was the process of kind of learning about them and thinking about them? Well, I started with the idea for the class that I taught at, at my church before I wrote that the book is based on. I started with the idea of who are the women we hear nothing about? <laughs> and that's actually, and it could have been men. I mean, there are plenty of men in the Bible who exhibit all these traits also. <clears throat> but I thought, you know, I want to kind of find some women, particularly that we just don't know anything about. So it actually started with the idea of obscurity <laughs> and, and kind of thinking, OK, you know, who can I pull up? Then when I did that, I tried to kind of put on my English professor hat, my literary scholar hat, and I tried to kind of fill in the gaps of their story, because very often in the biblical narrative, we just get action. Uh, we don't get a lot of motives, but I'm like, okay, what if Jane Austen was writing this? <laughs> or what, I'm not gonna say Virginia Woolf because I wouldn't understand it. But, um, but you know, what if, what if someone was filling this in as an actual story? So that's kind of how I went about it. And, you know, yes, obviously I'm guessing at some things of what they thought, but I, I was really trying to humanize them and trying to make them people that I could connect with because I don't use oil lamps. And I, you know, I don't have a husband who's a prophet and I, sometimes it's hard to maybe connect with some of these stories. So I just tried to, in my head, sort of connect with them as just one human to another. And for me, that involved looking at it a little bit as an English professor and filling in some of what was, I thought might be in their story. Yeah, that's a good question. So the comment was you noticed a, a, a connection between these women and the fact that they certainly dealt with their own situation, their personal circumstances, but there was that added blessing that often the community or sometimes the whole nation can benefit from that. Um, that is, to be honest, not something I was thinking about uh, when I wrote the book, but when I started to think about this talk in light of Women's History Month, that's when I began to think, you know, sometimes we are so focused on our own situations and we need to be, right? If you have an army of 400 bearing down on your household, you need to be focused up. Okay, but within that, and especially if we're acting in an authentic, passionate way, in a way that we feel God is moving us forward in, there are sometimes spillover effects that you identify and that we don't even think about. And so it was actually for this talk that I started to think about how these women were acting in their own circumstances. But if we take a step back and see the people they were impacting, it just really expands. And I think as an educator, 
um, that's also something that we think about because we see a new crop of students in the co at the college level every four months, right? Librarians every four years or sometimes four months, depending on what class you're connected with, right? And while we might see students again, we usually see them only for a short period of time. And so it's easy to think, how small is my impact? I'm helping them with a research paper, how, right? But we have, I know as educators in our mind, the fact that it's actually an investment. That's why I use the language of investment for the chapter on generosity, that we're really putting something into these individuals that might bear a lot of fruit and will cause that spillover effect and that overflow effect. So yeah, I didn't really think about it, honestly, for the book consciously, but when I was putting this together, I was like, wow, that's, and that's also great, I think, for Women's History Month. There are a lot of women and others, of course, in uh, other groups that we celebrate who just kind of deal with what they have to deal with where they are, but now we look back and, and we see exactly what they really accomplished and the people who were blessed by it. So thanks for that, Colin. Actually, thank you, Katie, for that question. I guess I'd just say Dr. Fry, we're all being so formal here. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, and I just mentioned this to Dean Rusa five, five minutes before this talk, uh, I, I think I'm gonna actually start bringing this book into my first year seminar. First year seminar at Pepperdine is a, yeah, see I didn't when you had me for the first year seminar, but I think I'm gonna switch it up. Uh, the first year seminar is a, it's kind of an onboarding class for students their first semester at Pepperdine. And I teach a class that's focused on spiritual autobiography. So we're looking at people's spiritual stories, but how they tell their own story. And I just began to think, you know, bringing a book like this in where it's other people's perspectives of someone's story and someone's spiritual experiences that might actually kind of flesh out the class a little bit. And it's also just fun, I think, as a student to have, uh, to use works that professors have written or that they're personally invested in. I used this book recently in uh, a spiritual writing class that I'm teaching too long, right? Um, and it was fun to kind of share from my own perspective. So yeah, I'm actually thinking of expanding what I'm doing in the first year seminar a little bit from just autobiographical writing to just more adding some general stories of women. So I'm thinking of adding this. Also, I don't do any biblical women in that class. So it could be interesting to add it. So thanks for that question. Is it time for the quiz or no? All right, anyone else? Or Good. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming.